I'm Sherrett and I'm going to talk about watering and feeding turf. Watering or irrigation is done during the summer months when the grass does not receive rainfall. So even in Ohio where we have 40 inches of rain a year, we still have drought periods the months of June, July and August. Irrigation is added then to maintain turf growth and to keep the growth the turf healthy. It's particularly important on sand-based fields. Professional fields like this are grown on sand and have to have an irrigation system in place in order to keep the grass alive. This is Emirates Stadium, um, an Arsenal Stadium, and the grass is the water is turned on at half time to also help the game. The game is much faster and the ball moves much faster across a grass that has been slightly watered. In baseball it's critical also for infield management. If the clay infield gets too dry it creates d large dust clouds and moves away. If it gets too wet it becomes a muddy mess. So um, water is used in baseball to manage the playability of that clay infield. If we look at how water gets into a system, it's through rain and it's through supplemental irrigation. Water leaves a turf grass system through evapotranspiration. That's a combination of evaporation from the grass plant and transpiration from the soil. And the evapotranspiration rate will depend on the type of plant, the time of day, the soil, etc, etc. So the evapotranspiration rate is key and typically an evapotranspiration rate for turf during the summer would be anywhere from a tenth of an inch to a quarter of an inch lost from the system on a daily basis. So that's what we look to replenish. Um, so for example, if two tenths of an inch are lost each day from a turf grass system, a ballpark figure would be to, to water that grass if there's no rain with one inch of water per week. We apply irrigation in many different ways. This is an in-ground irrigation or sprinkler system. It's the most important type of irrigation, but it's the most efficient and it can go on a timer or a clock so it can be done at any time of the day and it has, um, it's very efficient and it produces very good quality head-to-head -head coverage of water. It's important to make sure that you watch these irrigation systems come on and that you have them audited um, every two or three years to make sure that there is indeed head-to-head -head coverage and that there are not any broken irrigation heads etc. Another way that we apply water to turf is to use water cannons or rain trains. These are units that are attached to a hose, they may be gas powered and then the unit moves very slowly across the field. So you need some manpower to move these units from field to field. It usually takes two to three hours for them to move the full length of a field. Syringing is something that is done just to cool the grass down, to help newly germinated seed or sod. It is not a way of, of replenishing evapotranspiration rates, it's just done as a, um, a stress relieving practice. A turf grass plant will go through many different stages um, if it starts to get um, droughty. First of all it will wilt and we'll look at some of those symptoms. And then permanent wilt means that the all the moisture is leaving the turf grass plant and you'll start to see it browning and collapsing in on itself and then it will completely dry out. At that point of desiccation some grasses like perennial ryegrass may actually die. Some grasses like Kentucky bluegrass can stay dormant for several weeks as long as the base of the plant called the crown, um, as long as the crown stays hydrated it can come out of dormancy once we get rain but if not then it would die also. This is a cross-sectional uh, figure of what grass looks like when it needs to get watered. You can see after it's rained it's almost flat and then as it gets more dry the leaf starts to curl. This is a close-up of droughty turf where the water is leaving the plant cells and the leaves are starting to shrink in and collapse in on themselves and go brown. This is turf that's starting to dry out, desiccate, may eventually end up in turf death. This grass that's gone completely brown may actually die. One of the key symptoms is footprinting. The grass has actually lost all turgidity, which means there's no water left in the plant, so or very little water. So when you stand on it, it doesn't spring back up, but leaves these footprints. 
and then it may actually go a darker colour like a dark brown or a bluish black before it uh, wilts. Not just the grass but you can also test the soil to see how dry that is. The soil should be moist in the top four to six inches. If it isn't it will feel crumbly and dry, there will be no moisture in there. You may even see some signs of, of cracking which is an indicator of dry conditions. Moisture and surface hardness go hand in hand. On native soil fields, if they get too dry, they get very hard. The table on the right talks about hardness of fields in relation to safety. Ideally, for a, safe, a field to be safe, it needs to be less than 100 Gmax. If it gets too hard, there's a possibility a player could get injured or get a concussion. And you can see there at the bottom, compacted and frozen natural turf soils um, can actually get as, as high as 400 to 500 Gmax, which is extremely unsafe and too hard. Ideally, as you can see, an uncompacted, pristine, natural turf athletic field would be around 100 to 130. So on native soil fields, the bottom line is if it gets too hard, they can become dangerous. So even in situations where um, it's, it's difficult to get water on fields during the summer months from a safety issue, they really should be watered. On the opposite side of that spectrum, there are fields that are watered too much, especially if there's an in-ground irrigation system, there's a tendency for them to get overwatered. One of the symptoms of that, of course, is to actually see standing water on the field and to smell this rotten egg smell, um, as there's a chemical reduction process going on in the soil. There are also indicator weeds and problems like algae, yellow nut sedge and power annua, which is annual bluegrass. They are typical indicators that there are, there's too much water on the field. And of course mud. Once native soils get too wet, they turn to mud. So how, do, uh, how does a groundsman keep um, water off a field if there's going to be a big rain event? These are called rain tarps, basically big plastic covers that are rolled out. It takes a lot of manpower, they're very heavy, um, but they can be stretched out across the field prior to a game to try and stop as much rain getting on the grass surface as possible. In baseball that's critical because the infield is made of clay, if it gets wet it just turns to a quagmire. So baseball fields, especially at the professional level, if there's even a slight chance that rain's coming in, those infields will get covered with a rain tarp. When do we apply water? When is the best time of day, afternoon, evening or morning? First of all, should we water in the afternoon? No, the evapotranspiration rates are too high. So as quickly as you put water on, it's being evaporated off. This is a waste of water. In the evening, it could encourage turf diseases, especially during the summer when the evening nighttime temperatures are above 70 degrees. If that leaf tissue stays wet all night, there's a good chance that, that turf is going to get a, a disease like brown patch or pythium. Morning then is the absolute best time to apply water to turf. The T rates are low, it's generally not windy and the turf grass will, gr will dry out quickly and therefore prov um, not be as susceptible to disease. Looking at turf nutrition, there are 17 essential elements that the plant needs. Carbon, hydrogen and oxygen are the basic elements that the plant gets from the air and from water. And then the other elements the plant gets from soils and the macro or primary elements are nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. The secondary elements are calcium, magnesium and sulfur. And then the plant needs very small amounts of iron, manganese, zinc, copper, boron, molybdenum, chlorine and nickel. Now, if we look at nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium, um, a, plant, a turf grass plant it has anywhere from 4 to 5 percent nitrogen in its leaf tissue, about half a percent phosphorus, 3 percent potassium. So if you buy a bag of fertilizer, it typically has a ratio of 513 or 512 or something like that NPK because that's in the same ratio that the turf grass plant needs those nutrients. Nitrogen is the most important of the three macronutrients and therefore nitrogen is what all of the fertilizer programs are based on. You can see that nitrogen has a fantastic effect on growth, green growth. But if you put too much nitrogen on, it can have a detrimental effect on root growth. So ideally we have this balance of a 614 or a 312 ratio of NPK. Too much nitrogen can also affect wear tolerance. 
This is a graph that was produced by Dr. Caro showing that there is a midpoint where medium nitrogen is good for wear tolerance on an athletic field or a turf and then as you start to apply very high amounts of nitrogen the wear tolerance significantly reduces. Cool season grasses are typically fertilized in the fall and late fall prior to winter. Um, because cool season grasses grow like crazy in the spring and they, they're very stressed over the summer months, the fall period is the best time to apply fertilizer to them. Warm season grasses do very well in the spring and summer because they like to they can grow and, and they thrive in very hot dry condition and hot conditions. So our warm season grasses are typically fed during the spring and summer months. We use fertilizers as a way of applying food to turf and these are the three main sources. There's synthetic fertilizer which is man-made, there is organic fertilizer which comes from manures and from sewage and from plant and uh, animal byproducts and then there's compost which are bulky materials that come from things like yard waste, sewage and mush spent mushroom compost etc. The synthetic fertilizers um, have been around since the early 1920s and uh, have really at that time revolutionized the turf grass management industry. Uh, until then we'd, we, we would apply manure all over these fields but having a granular fertilizer being able to apply it very quickly and efficiently really revolutionized the industry. You can see there it has that ratio of a 412, 412 and a half um, of the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium 21411. These are the pros and cons of the fertilizer types. There is definitely a shift in, in people wanting to apply more natural organic products rather than using the synthetic man-made fertilizers. So we'll just look really quickly at the pros and cons of each. Synthetic fertilizers are inexpensive and they're extremely efficient. They're custom made for not just the sport in question and the grass in question, but the time of year, the location, um, sizes, etc. Um, they are custom made and extremely efficient. Unfortunately, they are, a lot of them are um, derived from non-renewable sources like the phosphorus mines. They do require burning of fossil fuels for their manufacture and if you apply too much of them they have a potential for turf burn because they, some of them can be high in salt. The natural organics then, uh, they are a renewable resource and therefore considered more sustainable. They have a low burn potential. They, some of them may improve soil health if they are bulky materials. They are, however, extremely expensive and they have a low nitrogen content. It's very difficult, in fact impossible, to find a natural organic fertilizer with greater than about 10% nitrogen. Um, and on top of them have not having as much nitrogen in them, they are also very expensive. And some of them, if they're sewage or manure based, can have quite an offensive odor, but that usually only lasts a couple of weeks. One of the important things about the fit, about feeding turf is that we do it in a way where we don't get peaks and valleys of growth and then nothing. Ideally we want to have a gradual supply of food for the grass over a period of 6 to 12 weeks. So this is what this is termed slow release. If you ever see a term a bag of fertilizer that says slow release fertilizer, it means that the food or the nitrogen and the other nutrients are released periodically steadily over a period of six to eight or twelve weeks. One of the issues right now in turf fertilization is that the phosphorus is being taken out of uh, synthetic made fertilizers and the reason for that is that phosphorus is ending up in water systems. This is an aerial view of Lake Erie. Phosphorus is in the water, it's coming in on sediment, basically soil. The phosphorus is carried with the soil it gets into a water system, it overloads the water with nutrients, it ends up then that the nutrients encourage blue-green algae and the blue-green blue algae is toxic to fish so we end up with uh, water that is pea-green and soupy and the fish die and it can completely you know obviously ruin the charter boat fishing industry and um, tourism and the environment is obviously negatively infected, affected. Um, we know from the last 10 years of research that lawn care fertilizers are not causing this issue. The issue is 
agriculture land, soil erosion, sediment runoff, taking fertiliser with it, getting into the water systems. But that's not to say that as turf grass managers we can't do everything that we can to prevent the phosphorus that we apply to turf ending up in the water. How do we do that? Um, oh, this is, a, this is a billboard that was on the way to Dayton that we saw uh, some time ago. There is a misconception then that if you apply fertiliser to your lawn it ends up in Lake Erie or Grand Lake St Mary's or another water system and that's actually not the, not the case at all uh, but there is this, mis this perception out there. What happens when you apply phosphorus to soil it's fixed onto soil particles very very tightly. Some of it will be taken up by the plant. There's only a couple of ways that phosphorus that we apply to turf could end up in a water system. First would be non-target and that means that fertilizer is applied to a drive or a sidewalk or somewhere hard surface and not swept up and then it ends up with rains and it ends up in the storm drain. Another one is if we apply fertilizer to bare soil and then we get rain and then that bare soil washes away we get runoff and erosion of that soil into a storm drain. And then if clippings are removed, obviously clippings contain phosphorus, that would be another way of phosphorus leaving a turf system. But if phosphorus and other nutrients are applied to a healthy turf, they will not leave the system. That's the bottom line. This ends the slideshow, watering and feeding turf.